A young boy sleeps soundly in Lansing, Michigan, but havoc wakes him. A frightening confusion of pistol shots and shouting and smoke and flames. Under cover of night, two men have taken torches to the house to drive out the father, that belligerent revolutionary who stirred up the peaceful folk. The boy grew to be a criminal. He turned away from the spirit his father had preached and toward all the things that keep men imprisoned in their own minds. Filled with hate, he threw it all away. His life became a silent, self-destructive protest against the system. He became what so many of us became, the wasted promise of American youth. How many of us spent those countless hours depressed and angry? How many of us spent countless of our nights at the bars? How many of us have spent years of our lives complaining about the system, but failing to lift a finger against it because we were too high, too weak, too lazy, too apathetic. That boy's father was murdered. Not that night in the burning house, but sometime later. And when that boy became a man, he said, it has always been my belief that I too will die by violence. I have done all that I can to be prepared. That boy became the most dangerous man in this country for his time. But it was only after he turned away from all the things that keep men in prison in their own minds, only after he turned toward the spirit. He saw through the trappings of the material. He saw through to the truth of American society. We worship filth and we become so engrossed in our comfort down here in the mud that we will suffer violence and dishonor and the greatest indignities imaginable just to keep ourselves comfortable in that mud. Rather than stand like free men and women braving the master's whips and the overseer's bullets. Do not fool yourselves. We are slaves. And until we face our oppressors without fear, without fear of whips or of bullets, we will remain slaves. Malcolm X was once a boy named Malcolm Little. That terrorist, that threat to national security, that destroyer of traditional American values, he was once a little boy, awakened by gunshots and the fires of hateful men, was once a reckless youth, put to sleep by the meaninglessness of American life, and his own frustration and impotence to change it. That monster who found religion and changed his name, they called him a fanatic, a racist, a hate monger, an extremist. And I say unto you all that he should be a model for every American. We must question why it is that Malcolm X is demonized while men like Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela are sold to us as veritable saints. Martin Luther King was a degenerate and a hypocrite who talked a good game about being a Christian while cheating on his wife. Malcolm X, in contrast, was a strict adherent to his own religion and there was no falsehood in him. Nelson Mandela was a literal terrorist who hanged tires around people's necks and lit them on fire. Malcolm X, who never bombed cars or tortured other men to death, encouraged his people to act in self-defense. Well, I say, and I say it again, you've been had, you've been took, you've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok. Why are King and Mandela blessed by our federal government while Malcolm X is reviled? It is because King and Mandela, like so many in the government and the media, were Marxists, and Malcolm X was not. It is because King and Mandela preached dependence on the system, and Malcolm X rejected it. 
And it's because King and Mandela wanted recognition by the government. And Malcolm X wanted nothing from it. He taught his people to be self-sufficient, to own their own businesses, to be responsible for their own communities and their own lives. He taught his people to stand up for themselves and to take control of their destiny, not to beg the white man's government for more handouts. He taught his people to revolt rather than submit. And were he alive today, Obama would have him prosecuted by the Department of Justice. Last Thursday, CNN reported that the Department of Justice would be pivoting away from ISIS as the main threat of terrorism in this country and focusing instead on anti-government groups within the United States. Domestic terror groups pose a greater threat to Americans than ISIS or Al-Qaeda, a Justice Department official said Wednesday. But what is a domestic terror group? What is a hate group? Who is our government targeting, if not the people beheading journalists and shouting death to America? According to Assistant Attorney General John Carlin, the real terrorists are those who promote anti-government views, racism, bigotry, and anarchy, and other despicable beliefs. I reckon that labels every single person in this room a domestic terrorist. So welcome to the watch list, my fellow Americans. You are now an enemy of the state, just like me. And who did John Carlin cite as examples of this new breed of domestic terrorist? He cited Dylan Roof, the lone wolf driven mad by psychotropic drugs who shot nine people in a church. He cited a man and woman who killed two police officers in Las Vegas. Ten years ago, not a person on this earth would have called that terrorism. We would have called those acts of violence and the perpetrators criminals. So what in God's name has happened? I've said this a hundred times, and I will say it a hundred more. The federal government of the United States of America is waging a war against its own citizens. For 40 years now, we have been told that the government is waging a war on drugs, when in fact it has been waging a war on our fellow Americans. A child molester in this country will get six years in prison, while a man selling his own prescription of morphine to a cop lands 20 years. A citizen who kills a cop is a murderer, while a cop who murders a citizen was just doing his job. Entire communities are turned into militarized zones, and the police talk about doing tours of duty in certain neighborhoods. When are Americans going to wake up to the fact that this is a literal war, and that the government has turned hostile to our countrymen? For 14 years now, we have been told that the government is waging a war on terror when in fact, it has been preparing for a war on us. The NSA has all our information, and they have convinced us that it is for our own safety. The FBI can investigate anyone in this room under the Patriot Act, and for years they have told us it's just a precaution. People like me are investigated only because someone called to complain, or it's just a big misunderstanding. Not because it's a real concern. But now, the DOJ has put all anarchists, all racialists, and all anti-government patriots on notice. You are now suspected terrorists. Looking back over the few years, it is clear that domestic terrorists and homegrown violent extremists remain a real and present danger to the United States, said the Assistant Attorney General John Carlin. We recognize that over the past few years, more people have died in this country in attacks by domestic extremists than in attacks associated with international terrorist groups. And how many have died, I wonder, from attacks by the police? You could add up all the so-called 
acts of domestic terror in the past 10 years, and it still would not add up to the number of people murdered by the police this year alone. But as long as you're watching CNN and Fox News and all the other propaganda outlets of the system, this contradiction will never occur to you. Because the news stations want us to believe that white supremacists are a threat to this nation. The news stations want us to believe that the gun-toting Tea Party is a bigger threat than ISIS. The news stations want us to believe that anarchism and anti-Semitism are existential dangers that must be stamped out by the federal government and all righteous citizens. Ask yourselves why. When founded, our country was one of free men. Those men who followed George Washington when he led the rebellion against the rightful government were not signing up for benefits packages and free college money. They were risking their lives and the lives of their families in taking a stand against tyranny. And every single one of those patriots would be labeled as domestic terrorists by the Department of Justice today. Our government still gives lip service to the Founding Fathers. But it does so as it targets all of us who follow their example. We are blacklisted. We are ostracized. We are defamed by the media. We are investigated, watched, and harassed by the FBI, the U.S. Marshals, the ATF, the DHS, and the IRS. Ask yourselves why. Why is the government so concerned about the people who cherish the ideals of our founding fathers? Why is the government so threatened by those of us who do not need it? Why is the government so friendly to communists and actual terrorists while demonizing those of us who believe in self-determination, self-ownership, and self-empowerment? Why is the government so worried about those of us with a fighting spirit who cannot be bought off by benefits packages and free college money? It is simply this. In leading lives independent of the government, we are living proof that a totalitarian government is not necessary. We are the example for all of those millions of Americans who are brainwashed by the news stations. We, who do not need the government to tell us who we can and cannot marry. We, who do not need the government to tell us what substances we can and cannot ingest. We, who do not need the government to provide us with social programs and health care. The role of the government is to protect this country from foreign aggression and domestic chaos. It is not to make everyone equal. It is not to care for every citizen like a mother would her child. It is not to rewrite history or support illegal immigrants or sell out our natural resources to mega corporations. And we who can see that have been labeled as criminally insane, as right-wing nut jobs, as conspiracy theorists, and now as domestic terrorists. So let me give you an illustration of the federal government's anti-terrorism efforts. I was making a pilgrimage to Egypt in the spring of 2012. The day before my return to the States, the FBI raided a compound where hate-mongering neo-Nazis had been making chemical weapons and preparing for a race war, which they planned to begin by storming Orlando City Hall just down the street here. Those skinhead monsters of the American Front were thankfully infiltrated by the FBI and stopped before they could unleash their reprehensible master plan and America could breathe easy once again. But what the newspapers didn't tell us is that FBI agent Kelly Boaz had fabricated the entire affair. They didn't tell us that Kelly Boaz had applied to the American front so he could infiltrate it himself, but because of his infiltration of an actual gang known for drug use and prostitution, he was denied admission by the law-abiding American Front. What the newspapers didn't tell us 
was that the FBI paid an informant $40,000 to infiltrate the American front once Agent Boaz was denied admission. This informant was paid $40,000 by the FBI. And what sort of evidence did he procure? Cell phone videos in which he himself attempted to instigate the members of the American front to violent actions. And when the news stations got a hold of these cell phone videos, they showed his instigation without pointing out the fact that he was the informant being paid by the FBI. Ask yourselves why the media is so interested in pushing the agenda of the Department of Justice. Two and a half years later, the newspaper stories began to change. Of the 14 arrested, only three of the members of the American Front entered pleas to possession of a weapon by a convicted felon. Because, as so often happens in our criminal justice system, they felt that it was better to take the deal than to risk a decade in prison for something they didn't do. The rest of the cases, which is to say the ones against those who did not have a criminal background, were simply dropped. Only one person of the 14 ever went to trial, and that was my friend Marcus Fayella. As I said, there came a point at which the newspaper stories started to change. A reporter from the Orlando Sentinel by the name of Henry Curtis, God bless him, he was the one reporter in America who actually did his journalistic duty and investigated the case beyond the initial police reports. He discovered that there was no evidence at all of any chemical weapons or of any plot to begin a race war. At the trial of Marcus Fayella, who was the leader of the American Front, Agent Boaz told the jury in all seriousness that the alarm cows and attack geese Fayella had trained to defend his farm from the FBI scared him. At the trial, the informant admitted but there was never any plot to commit any act of violence. In fact, the entire trial concerned a non-violent counter-demonstration against communists on May Day. The entire thing was a sick joke. Mr. Curtis reported fairly on the case, but more than this, he gave Mr. Fayella a fair shake and actually allowed him to tell his side of the story. Because one journalist did his job Marcus Fayella became a real person, not some deranged lunatic bent on attacking Orlando City Hall with ricin. To write a fair and balanced story about a man accused of such sensational crimes speaks greatly to the integrity of Mr. Curtis. But if you see the same trend that I do, then I fear it is only a matter of time before writing articles that embarrass the FBI and the DOJ and the state attorney will not become just unpopular, but criminal. For if the government can label anyone they want as a domestic terrorist, and a journalist speaks against the error of the government, then is that journalist not siding with the terrorist? And is he not thereby supporting terrorism? The first step in this slippery slope of illogic has already been taken. The Department of Justice has labeled pretty much every single supporter of this campaign as a potential domestic terrorist. Just as the leadership of the Libertarian Party of Florida tried to label all of my supporters as fascists and neo-Nazis. Neither is this simply empty rhetoric. We are all one step away from being landed in Guantanamo. I would point out to you that despite the fact that Marcus Fayella was innocent. And despite the fact that Agent Boaz complained of alarm clouds and attack geese, and despite the fact that the informant admitted that nothing nefarious had ever been contemplated, Marcus Fayella was still convicted of a felony. And he was convicted of all things of paramilitary training which is now a crime. Think about that. 
To the FBI and the U.S. Marshals and all other law enforcement agencies, I say, we are not your enemies. We are the American people. Do not make enemies of us. The American people have a long history of executing tyrants, both foreign and domestic. To my fellow citizens, I say, wake up to the war being waged on your own soil against your own countrymen. The federal government has harassed, imprisoned, and murdered countless of our people in the past 40 years in the name of the war on drugs. And for the past 14 years, it has been constructing a total police state all around us in the name of the war on terror. If you do not see what is coming, then you are blind. I am come to cause the blind to see. I am come to tell you that if you want peace, you must prepare for war. Like Malcolm X before me, I will preach until the day they gun me down that you were born free, that you were born human before you were a taxpayer or a government official, that you are an eternal soul whose power far exceeds the bounds imposed upon you by this tyrannical government. Fear not the coming day of wrath, brothers and sisters, but rejoice that you may have the chance to enter into the stream of history, gaining glory for all time as one of those heroic generations that declared itself free from its oppressors.